Section 104 of the Book of Household Management. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Household Management by Isabella Beaton. The Doctor. Chapter 43. Part 2. 2623. Concussion of brain. Stunning. This may be caused by a blow or a fall. Symptoms. Cold skin. Weak pulse. Almost total insensibility. Slow, weak breathing. Pupil of eye sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, than natural. Inability to move. Unwillingness to answer when spoken to. These symptoms come on directly after the accident. Treatment. Place the patient quietly on a warm bed. Send for a surgeon, and do nothing else for the first four or six hours. After this time, the skin will become hot, the pulse full, and the patient feverish altogether. If the surgeon has not arrived by the time these symptoms have set in, shave the patient's head and apply the following lotion. Number two. Mix half an ounce of sal ammoniac, two tablespoonfuls of vinegar, and the same quantity of gin or whiskey in half a pint of water. Then give this pill. Number one. Mix five grains of calomel and the same quantity of antimonial powder with a little bread crumb and make into two pills. Give a black draught three hours after the pill and two tablespoonfuls of the above-mentioned fever mixture every four hours. Keep on low diet. Leeches are sometimes to be applied to the head. These cases are often followed by violent inflammation of the brain. They can, therefore, only be attended to properly throughout by a surgeon. The great thing for people to do in these cases is nothing, contenting themselves with putting the patient to bed and waiting the arrival of a surgeon. 2624. The cholera and autumnal complaints. To oppose cholera, there seems no surer or better means than cleanliness, sobriety, and judicious ventilation. Where there is dirt, that is the place for cholera. Where windows and doors are kept most jealously shut, there cholera will find easiest entrance, and people who indulge in intemperate diet during the hot days of autumn are actually courting death. To repeat it, cleanliness, sobriety, and free ventilation almost always defy the pestilence. But in case of attack, immediate recourse should be had to a physician. The faculty say that a large number of lives have been lost in many seasons solely from delay in seeking medical assistance. They even assert that, taken early, the cholera is by no means a fatal disorder. The copious use of salt is recommended on very excellent authority. Other autumnal complaints there are, of which diarrhea is the worst example. They come on with pain, flatulence, sickness, with or without vomiting, followed by loss of appetite, general lassitude, and weakness. If attended to at the first appearance, they may soon be conquered, for which purpose it is necessary to assist nature in throwing off the contents of the bowels, which may be won by means of the following prescription. Take of calomel three grains, rhubarb eight grains, mix and take it in a little honey or jelly, and repeat the dose three times at the intervals of four or five hours. The next purpose to be answered is the defense of the lining membrane of the intestines from their acrid contents, which will be best effected by drinking copiously of linseed tea, or of a drink made by pouring boiling water on quince seeds, which are of a very mucilaginous nature, or, what is still better, full draughts of whey. If the complaint continue after these means have been employed, some astringent or binding medicine will be required, as a subjoined, take of prepared chalk two drams, cinnamon water seven ounces, syrup of poppies one ounce, mix, and take three tablespoonfuls every four hours. Should this fail to complete the cure, a half ounce of tincture of catechu or of kino may be added to it, and then it will seldom fail or a teaspoonful of the tincture of kino alone with a little water every three hours till the diarrhea is checked. While any symptoms of derangement are present, particular attention must be paid to the diet, which should be of a soothing, lubricating, and light nature, as instanced in veal or chicken broth, 
which should contain but little salt. Rice, batter, and bread puddings will be generally relished, and be eaten with advantage. But the stomach is too much impaired to digest food of a more solid nature. Indeed, we should give that organ, together with the bowels, as little trouble as possible, while they are so incapable of acting in their accustomed manner. Much mischief is frequently produced by the absurd practice of taking tincture of rhubarb, which is almost certain of aggravating that species of disorder of which we have now treated, for it is a spirit as strong as brandy, and cannot fail of producing harm upon a surface which is rendered tender by the formation and contact of vitiated bile. But our last advice is, upon the first appearance of such symptoms as are above detailed, have immediate recourse to a doctor where possible. 2625. To cure a cold. Put a large teacupful of linseed, with a quarter pound of sun raisins and two ounces of stick licorice into two quarts of soft water and let it simmer over a slow fire till reduced to one quart add to it a quart pound of pounded sugar candy a tablespoonful of old rum and a tablespoonful of the best white wine vinegar or lemon juice the rum and vinegar should be added as the decoction is taken for, if they are put in at first, the whole soon becomes flat and less efficacious. The dose is half a pint, made warm, on going to bed, and a little may be taken whenever the cough is troublesome. The worst cold is generally cured by this remedy in two or three days, and, if taken in time, is considered infallible. 2626. Cold on the chest. A flannel dipped in boiling water and sprinkled with turpentine, laid on the chest as quickly as possible, will relieve the most severe cold or hoarseness. 2627. Substances in the eye. To remove fine particles of gravel, lime, etc., the eye should be syringed with lukewarm water till free from them. Be particular not to worry the eye under the impression that the substance is still there, which the enlargement of some of the minute vessels makes the patient believe is actually the case. 2628. Sore eyes. Incorporate thoroughly, in a glass mortar or vessel, one part of strong citron ointment with three parts of spermaceti ointment. Use the mixture night and morning by placing a piece of the size of a pea in the corner of the eye affected, only to be used in cases of chronic or long-standing inflammation of the organ or its lids. 2629. Lime in the eye. Bathe the eye with a little weak vinegar and water, and carefully remove any little piece of lime which may be seen with a feather. If any lime has got entangled in the eyelashes, carefully clear it away with a bit of soft linen soaked in vinegar and water. Violent inflammation is sure to follow. A smart perch must be therefore administered, and in all probability a blister must be applied on the temple, behind the ear or nape of the neck. 2630. Sty in the eye. Styes are little abscesses which form between the roots of the eyelashes, and are rarely larger than a small pea. The best way to manage them is to bathe them frequently with warm water, or in warm poppy water if very painful. When they have burst, use an ointment composed of one part of citron ointment and four of spermaceti, well rubbed together, and smear along the edge of the eyelid. Give a grain or two of calomel with five or eight grains of rhubarb, according to the age of the child, twice a week. The old-fashioned and apparently absurd practice of rubbing the sty with a ring is as good and speedy a cure as that by any process of medicinal application, though the number of times it is rubbed, or the quality of the ring and direction of the strokes, has nothing to do with its success. The pressure and the friction excite the vessels of the part, and cause an absorption of the effused matter under the eyelash. The edge of the nail will answer as well as a ring. 2631. Inflammation of the eyelids. The following ointment has been found very beneficial in inflammations of the eyeball and edges of the eyelids. Take of prepared calomel, one scrubble. Spermaceti ointment, a half ounce. Mix them well together in a glass mortar. Apply a small quantity to each corner of the eye every night and morning, 
and also to the edges of the lids if they are infected. If this should not eventually remove the inflammation, elderflower water may be applied three or four times a day, by means of an eye cup. The bowels should be kept in a laxative state, by taking occasionally a quarter of an ounce of the Cheltenham or Epsom salts. 2632. Fasting. It is said by many able physicians that fasting is a means of removing incipient disease, and of restoring the body to its customary healthy sensations. Howard, the celebrated philanthropist, says a writer, used to fast one day in every week. Napoleon, when he felt his system unstrung, suspended his wonted repast, and took his exercise on horseback. Fits. 2633. Fits come on so suddenly, often without even the slightest warning, and may prove fatal so quickly, that all people should be acquainted at least with their leading symptoms and treatment, as a few moments, more or less, will often decide the question between life and death. The treatment, in very many cases at least, to be of the slightest use, should be immediate, as a person in a fit, of apoplexy, for instance, may die while a surgeon is being fetched from only the next street. We shall give, as far as the fact of our editing a work for non-professional readers will permit, the peculiar and distinctive symptoms of all kinds of fits, and the immediate treatment to be adopted in each case. 2,634. Apoplexy. These fits may be divided into two kinds, the strong and the weak. 2,635. 1. The strong kind. These cases mostly occur in stout, strong, short-necked, bloated-faced people who are in the habit of living well. Symptoms? The patient may or may not have had headache, sparks before his eyes, with confusion of ideas and giddiness for a day or two before the attack. When it takes place, he falls down insensible. The body becomes paralyzed, generally more so on one side than the other. The face and head are hot, and the blood vessels about them swollen. The pupils of the eyes are larger than natural, and the eyes themselves are fixed. The mouth is mostly drawn down at one corner. The breathing is like loud snoring, the pulse full and hard. Treatment. Place the patient immediately in bed, with his head well raised. Take off everything that he has round his neck, and bleed freely and at once from the arm. If you have not got a lancet, use a penknife or anything suitable that may be at hand. Apply warm mustard poultices to the soles of the feet and the insides of the thighs and legs. Put two drops of castor oil, mixed up with eight grains of calomel, on the top of the tongue, as far back as possible, a most important part of the treatment being to open the bowels as quickly and freely as possible. The patient cannot swallow, but these medicines, especially the oil, will be absorbed into the stomach altogether independent of any voluntary action. If possible, throw up a warm turpentine cluster, two tablespoonfuls of oil of turpentine in a pint of warm gruel, or, if this cannot be obtained, one composed of about a quart of warm and salt and water and soap. Cut off the hair and apply rags dipped in weak vinegar and water, or weak gin and water, or even simple cold water, to the head. If the blood vessels about the head and neck are much swollen, Put from eight to ten leeches on the temple opposite to the paralyzed side of the body. Always send for a surgeon immediately, and act according to the above rules, doing more or less according to the means at hand, and the length of time that must necessarily elapse until he arrives. A pint or even a quart of blood in a very strong person may be taken away. When the patient is able to swallow, give him the number one pills and the number one mixture directly. The number one pills are made as follows. Mix five grains of calomel and the same quantity of antimonial powder with a little bread crumb. Make into two pills the dose for a full-grown person. For the number one mixture, dissolve one ounce of Epsom salts in half a pint of senna tea. Take a quarter of the mixture as a dose. Repeat these remedies if the bowels are not well opened. Keep the patient's head well raised and cool as above. Give very low diet indeed. Gruel, arrowroot, and the like. When a person is recovering, he should have blisters applied to the nape of the neck, his bowels should be kept well open, light diet given, and fatigue, worry, and excess of all kinds avoided. 2,636. 2. The weak kind. Symptoms. 
These attacks are more frequently preceded by warning symptoms than the first kind. The face is pale, the pulse weak, and the body, especially the hands and legs, cold. After a little while, these symptoms sometimes alter to those of the first class in a mild degree. Treatment At first, if the pulse is very feeble indeed, a little brandy and water or sal volatile must be given. Mustard poultices are to be put, as before, to the soles of the feet and the insides of the thighs and legs. Warm bricks, or bottles filled with warm water, are also to be placed under the armpits. When the strength has returned, the body become warmer, and the pulse fuller and harder. The head should be shaved, and wet rags applied to it, as before described. Leeches should be put, as before, to the temple opposite the side paralyzed, and the bowels should be opened as freely and as quickly as possible. Bleeding from the arm is often necessary in these cases, but a non-professional person should never have recourse to it. Blisters may be applied to the nape of the neck at once. The diet in those cases should not be so low as in the former. Indeed, it is often necessary, in a day or so after one of these attacks, to give wine, strong beef tea, etc., according to the condition of the patient's strength. 2637. Distinctions between apoplexy and epilepsy. 1. Apoplexy mostly happens in people over 30, whereas epilepsy generally occurs under that age, at any rate for the first time. A person who has epileptic fits over 30 has generally suffered from them for some years. 2. Again, in apoplexy, the body is paralyzed and therefore has not the convulsions which take place in epilepsy. 3. The peculiar snoring will also distinguish apoplexy from epilepsy. 2638. Distinctions between apoplexy and drunkenness. 1. The known habits of the person. 2. The fact of a person who was perfectly sober and sensible a little time before being found in a state of insensibility. 3. The absence in apoplexy of the smell of drink on applying the nose to the mouth. 4. A person in a fit of apoplexy cannot be roused at all. In drunkenness he mostly can, to a certain extent. 2639. Distinction between apoplexy and hysteria. Hysterics mostly happen in young, nervous, unmarried women, and are attended with convulsions, sobbing, laughter, throwing about of the body, etc., etc. 2640. Distinction between apoplexy and poisoning by opium. It is exceedingly difficult to distinguish between these two cases. In poisoning by opium, however, we find the particular smell of the drug in the patient's breath. We should also, in forming our opinion, take into consideration the person's previous conduct, whether he has been low and desponding for some time before, or has ever talked about committing suicide. 2641. Epilepsy. Falling Sickness. Those fits mostly happen, at any rate for the first time, to young people, and are more common in boys than girls. They are produced by numerous causes. Symptoms. The fit may be preceded by pains in the head, palpitations, etc., etc., but it mostly happens that the person falls down insensible suddenly, and without any warning whatever. The eyes are distorted, so that only their whites can be seen. There is mostly foaming from the mouth, the fingers are clinched, and the body, especially on one side, is much agitated. The tongue is often thrust out of the mouth. When the fit goes off, the patient feels drowsy and faint, and often sleeps soundly for some time. Treatment. During the fit, keep the patient flat on his back, with his head slightly raised, and prevent him from doing any harm to himself. Dash cold water into his face, and apply smelling salts to his nose. Loosen his short collar, etc. Hold a piece of wood about as thick as a finger, the handle of a toothbrush or knife will do as well, between the two rows of teeth, at the back part of the mouth. This will prevent the tongue from being injured. A teaspoonful of common salt thrust into the patient's mouth during the fit is of much service. The after-treatment of these fits is various, and depends entirely upon their causes. A good general rule, however, is always to keep the bowels well open and the patient quiet, and free from fatigue, worry, and excess of all kinds. 2642. Fainting fits are sometimes very dangerous, and at others perfectly harmless. 
the question of danger depending altogether upon the causes which have produced them, and which are exceedingly various. For instance, fainting produced by disease of the heart is a very serious symptom indeed, whereas that arising from some slight cause, such as the sight of blood, etc., need cause no alarm whatever. The symptoms of simple fainting are so well known that it would be quite superfluous to enumerate them here. The treatment consists in laying the patient at full length upon his back, with his head upon a level with the rest of his body, loosening everything about the neck, dashing cold water into the face, and sprinkling vinegar and water about the mouth, applying smelling salts to the nose, and, when the patient is able to swallow, in giving a little warm brandy and water, or about twenty drops of sal volatile in water. 2,643. Hysterics. These fits take place, for the most part, in young, nervous, unmarried women. They happen much less often in married women, and even, in some rare cases indeed, in men. Young women who are subject to these fits are apt to think that they are suffering from all the ills that flesh is heir to, and the false symptoms of disease which they show are so like the true ones that it is often exceedingly difficult to detect the difference. The fits themselves are mostly preceded by great depression of spirits, shedding of tears, sickness, palpitation of the heart, etc. A pain as if a nail were being driven in is also often felt at one particular part of the head. In almost all cases, when a fit is coming on, pain is felt on the left side. This pain rises gradually until it reaches the throat, and then gives the patient a sensation as if she had a pellet there, which prevents her from breathing properly and, in fact, seems to threaten actual suffocation. The patient now generally becomes insensible and faints. The body is thrown about in all directions, froth issues from the mouth, incoherent expressions are uttered, and fits of laughter, crying, or screaming take place. When the fit is going off, the patient mostly cries bitterly, sometimes knowing all, and at others nothing of what has taken place, and feeling general soreness all over the body. Treatment during the fit. Place the body in the same position as for simple fainting, and treat, in other respects, as directed in the article on epilepsy. Always well loosen the patient's stays, and when she is recovering and able to swallow, give twenty drops of cell volatile in a little water. The after-treatment of these cases is very various. If the patient is of a strong constitution, she should live on plain diet, take plenty of exercise, and take occasional doses of castor oil or an aperient mixture, such as that described as number one, in previous numbers. If, as is mostly the case, the patient is weak and delicate, she will require a different mode of treatment altogether. Good nourishing diet, gentle exercise, cold baths, occasionally a dose of number three myrrh and aloes pills at night, and a dose of compound iron pills twice a day. As to the myrrh and aloes pills, number three, Ten grains made into two pills are a dose for a full-grown person. Of the compound iron pills, number four, the dose for a full-grown person is also ten grains, made into two pills. In every case, amusing the mind and avoiding all causes of over-excitement are of great service in bringing about a permanent cure. 2644. Liver Complaint and Spasms a very obliging correspondent recommends the following, from personal experience. Take four ounces of dried dandelion root, one ounce of the best ginger, a quarter ounce of columba root, braise and boil all together in three pints of water till it is reduced to a quart. Strain and take a wine glass full every four hours. Our correspondent says it is a safe and simple medicine for both liver complaint and spasms. 2,645. Lumbago. A new and successful mode of treating lumbago, advocated by Dr. Day, is a form of counter-irritation, said to have been introduced into this country by the late Sir Anthony Carlyle, and which consists in the instantaneous application of a flat iron button, gently heated in a spirit lamp, to the skin. Dr. Gorgon published about three years ago an account of some cases very successfully treated by nearly similar means. Dr. Corgan's plan was, however, to touch the surface of the part affected at intervals of half an inch as lightly and rapidly as possible. Dr. Day has found greater advantages to result from drawing the flat surface of the heated button lightly over the affected part, so as to act on a greater extent of surface. 
The doctor speaks so enthusiastically of the benefit to be derived from this practice that it is evidently highly deserving attention. 2646. Palpitation of the heart. Where palpitation occurs as symptomatic of indigestion, the treatment must be directed to remedy that disorder. When it is consequent on a plethoric state, purgatives will be effectual. In this case, the patient should abstain from every kind of diet likely to produce a plethoric condition of body. Animal food and fermented liquor must be particularly avoided. Too much indulgence in sleep will also prove injurious. When the attacks arise from nervous irritability, the excitement must be allayed by change of air and a tonic diet. Should the palpitation originate from organic derangement, it must be, of course, beyond domestic management. Luxurious living, indolence, and tight lacing often produce this affection. Such cases are to be conquered with a little resolution. 2647. Poisons shall be the next subject for remark, and we anticipate more detailed instructions for the treatment of persons poisoned by giving a simple list of the principal poisons with their antidotes or remedies. Oil of vitriol, aquafortis, spirit of salt, antidotes or remedies, magnesia, chalk, soap and water. Emetic tartar, antidotes or remedies, oily drinks, solution of oak bark. Salt of lemons or acid of sugar, antidotes or remedies, chalk, whiting, lime or magnesia and water, sometimes an emetic draught. Prussic acid, antidotes or remedies, Pump on back, smelling salts to nose, artificial breathing, chloride of lime to nose. Pearlash, soap lees, smelling salts, nitre, hartshorn, sal volatile, antidotes or remedies, lemon juice and vinegar and water. Arsenic, fly powder or white arsenic, king's yellow or yellow arsenic, antidotes or remedies, emetics, lime water, soap and water, sugar and water, oily drinks. Mercury, corrosive sublimate, calomel. Antidotes or remedies, whites of eggs, soap and water. Opium, laudanum. Antidotes and remedies. Emetic draught, vinegar and water, dashing cold water on chest and face, walking up and down two or three hours. Lead, White lead, sugar of lead or gular's extract, antidotes or remedies, Epsom salts, castor oil, and emetics. Copper, bluestone, verdigris, antidote or remedy, whites of eggs, sugar and water, castor oil, gruel. Zinc, antidotes or remedies, lime water, chalk and water, soap and water. Iron, Antidotes or remedies, magnesia, warm water. Henbane, hemlock, nightshade or foxglove, antidotes or remedies, emetics and castor oil, brandy and water if necessary. Poisonous food, antidotes or remedies, emetics and castor oil. 2648. The symptoms of poisoning may be known for the most part from those of some diseases, which they are very like, from the fact of their coming on immediately after eating or drinking something, whereas those of disease come on, in most cases at least, by degrees and with warnings. In most cases where poison is known or suspected to have been taken, the first thing to be done is to empty the stomach well and immediately, by means of mustard mixed in warm water, or plain warm salt and water, or better, this draught which we call number one, twenty grains of sulphate of zinc in an ounce and a half of water. This draught to be repeated in a quarter of an hour if vomiting does not ensue. The back part of the throat should be well tickled with a feather, or two of the fingers thrust down it to induce vomiting. The cases where vomiting must not be used are those where the skin has been taken off, and the parts touched irritated and inflamed by the poison taken and where the action of vomiting would increase the evil. Full instructions are given in the article on each particular poison as to where emetics are or are not to be given. The best and safest way of emptying the stomach is by means of the stomach pump, as in certain cases 
the action of vomiting is likely to increase the danger arising from the swollen and congested condition of the blood vessels of the head, which often takes place. In the hands, however, of any one else than a surgeon, it would be not only useless, but harmful, as a great deal of dexterity, caution, and experience are required to use it properly. After having made these brief introductory remarks, we shall now proceed to particulars. 2,649. Sulfuric acid, or oil of vitriol, a clear, colorless liquid of an oily appearance. Symptoms in those who have swallowed it. When much is taken, these come on immediately. There is great burning pain, extending from the mouth to the stomach. Vomiting of a liquid of a dark coffee color, often mixed with shreds of flesh and streaks of blood. The skin inside the mouth is taken off, and the exposed surface is at first white and after a time becomes brownish. There are sometimes spots of a brown color round the lips and on the neck, caused by drops of the acid falling on these parts. There is great difficulty of breathing, owing to the swelling at the back part of the mouth. After a time there is much depression of strength, with a quick, weak pulse and cold, clammy skin. The face is pale and has a very anxious look. When the acid swallowed has been greatly diluted in water, the same kind of symptoms occur, only in a milder degree. Treatment Give a mixture of magnesia in milk and water, or, if this cannot be obtained, of finely powdered chalk or whiting, or even of the plaster torn down from the walls or ceiling, in milk and water. The mixture should be nearly as thick as cream, and plenty of it given. As well as this, simple gruel, milk, or thick flour and water are very useful, and should be given in large quantities. Violent inflammation of the parts touched by the acid is most likely to take place in the course of a little time, and can only be properly attended to by a surgeon. But if one cannot be obtained, leeches, the fever mixtures, the recipe for which appears repeatedly in previous paragraphs, thick drinks such as barley water, gruel, arrowroot, etc., must be had recourse to, according to the symptoms of each particular case and the means at hand. The inflamed condition of the back part of the mouth requires particular attention. When the breathing is very laboured and difficult in consequence, from fifteen to twenty leeches are to be immediately applied to the outside of the throat, and when they drop off, warm poppy fermentations constantly kept to the part. When the pain over the stomach is very great, the same local treatment is necessary, but if it is only slight, a good mustard poultice will be sufficient without the leeches. In all these cases, two tablespoonfuls of the fever mixture should be given every four hours, and only gruel or arrowroot allowed to be eaten for some days. 2650. Nitric acid, commonly known as aquafortis, or red spirit of nitre, a straw-colored fluid of the consistence of water, and which gives off dense white fumes on exposure to the air. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it much the same as in the case of sulfuric acid. In this case, however, the surface touched by the acid becomes yellowish. The tongue is mostly much swollen. Treatment, the same as for sulfuric acid. 2651. Muriatic acid, spirit of salt, a thin yellow fluid emitting dense white fumes on exposure to air. This is not often taken as a poison. The symptoms and treatment are much the same as those of nitric acid. And B. In no case of poisoning by these three acids should emetics ever be given. 2652. Oxalic acid, commonly called salt of lemons. This poison may be taken by mistake for Epsom salts, which it is a good deal like. It may be distinguished from them by its very acid taste, and its shape, which is that of needle-formed crystals each of which, if put into a drop of ink, will turn it to a reddish-brown, whereas Epsom salts will not change its color at all. When a large dose of this poison has been taken, death takes place very quickly indeed. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. A hot, burning, acid taste is felt in the act of swallowing, and vomiting of a greenish-brown fluid is produced, sooner or later, according to the quantity and strength of the poison taken. There is great tenderness felt over the stomach, followed by clammy perspirations and convulsions. The legs are often drawn up, and there is generally stupor, from which the patient, however, can easily be roused, 
and always great prostration of strength. The pulse is small and weak, and the breathing faint. Treatment Chalk or magnesia, made into a cream with water, should be given in large quantities, and afterwards the emetic draught above prescribed, or some mustard and water, if the draught cannot be got. The back part of the throat to be tickled with a feather, to induce vomiting. Arrowroot, gruel, and the like drinks are to be taken. When the prostration of strength is very great, and the body cold, warmth is to be applied to it, and a little brandy and water, or sal volatile and water, given. 2653. Prussic acid. A thin, transparent, and colorless liquid, with a peculiar smell, which greatly resembles that of bitter almonds. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. These come on immediately after the poison has been taken, and may be produced by merely smelling it. The patient becomes perfectly insensible, and falls down in convulsions. His eyes are fixed and staring, the pupils being bigger than natural. The skin is cold and clammy, the pulse scarcely perceptible, and the breathing slow and gasping. Treatment Very little can be done in these cases, as death takes place so quickly after the poison has been swallowed when it takes place at all. The best treatment, which should always be adopted in all cases, even though the patient appears quite dead, is to dash quantities of cold water on the back, from the top of the neck downwards. Placing the patient under a pump and pumping on him is the best way of doing this. Smelling salts are also to be applied to the nose, and the chest well rubbed with a camphor liniment. 2,654. Alkalies, potash, soda, and ammonia, or common smelling salts, with their principal preparations, pearlash, soap leaves, liquor potassi, nitre, salprinella, hartshorn, and sal volatile. Alkalies are seldom taken or given with a view of destroying life. They may, however, be swallowed by mistake. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed them. There is at first a burning, acrid taste in, and a sensation of tightness round, the throat, like that of strangling. The skin touched is destroyed, retching mostly followed by actual vomiting, then sets in. The vomited matters, often containing blood of a dark brown colour, with little shreds of flesh here and there, and always changing vegetable blue colours green. There is now great tenderness over the whole of the belly. After a little while, great weakness with cold, clammy sweats, a quick, weak pulse, and purging of bloody matters takes place. The brain, too, mostly becomes affected. Treatment Give two tablespoonfuls of vinegar or lemon juice in a glassful of water every few minutes until the burning sensation is relieved. Any kind of oil or milk may also be given, and will form soap when mixed with the poison in the stomach. Barley water, gruel, arrowroot, linseed tea, etc., are also very useful, and should be taken constantly and in large quantities. If inflammation should take place, it is to be treated by applying leeches and warm poppy fomentations to the part where the pain is most felt, and giving two tablespoonfuls of the fever mixture every four hours. The diet in all these cases should only consist of arrowroot or gruel for the first few days, and then of weak broth or beef tea for some time after. 2,655. When very strong fumes of smelling salts have in any way been inhaled, there is great difficulty of breathing, and alarming pain in the mouth and nostrils. In this case, let the patient inhale the steam of warm vinegar, and treat the feverish symptoms as before. 2,656. Arsenic mostly seen under the form of white arsenic or fly powder, and yellow arsenic or king's yellow. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. These vary very much, according to the form and dose in which the poison has been taken. There is faintness, depression, and sickness, with an intense burning pain in the region of the stomach, which gets worse and worse, and is increased by pressure. There is also vomiting of dark brown matter, sometimes mixed with blood and mostly great thirst, with a feeling of tightness round and of burning in the throat. Purging also takes place, the matters brought away being mixed with blood. The pulse is small and irregular, and the skin sometimes cold and clammy, and at others hot. 
The breathing is painful. Convulsions and spasms often occur. Treatment Give a couple of teaspoonfuls of mustard in a glass of water to bring on or assist vomiting, and also use the other means elsewhere recommended for the purpose. A solution, half of lime water and half of linseed oil, well mixed, may be given, as well as plenty of arrowroot, gruel or linseed tea. Simple milk is also useful. A little castor oil should be given to cleanse the intestines of all the poison, and the after symptoms treated on general principles. 2657. Corrosive sublimate. Mostly seen in the form of little heavy crystalline masses, which melt in water, and have a metallic taste. It is sometimes seen in powder. This is a most powerful poison. Symptoms. These mostly come on immediately after the poison has been taken. There is a coppery taste experienced in the act of swallowing, with a burning heat extending from the top of the throat down to the stomach, and also a feeling of great tightness round the throat. In a few minutes great pain is felt over the region of the stomach, and frequent vomiting of long, stringy white masses mixed with blood takes place. There is also mostly great purging. The countenance is generally pale and anxious, the pulse always small and frequent, the skin cold and clammy, and the breathing difficult. Convulsions and insensibility often occur, and are very bad symptoms indeed. The inside of the mouth is more or less swollen. Treatment Mix the whites of a dozen eggs in two pints of cold water, and give a glassful of the mixture every three or four minutes, until the stomach can contain no more. If vomiting does not now come on naturally, and supposing the mouth is not very sore or much swollen, an emetic draught, number one, may be given, and vomiting induced. The number one draught, we remind our readers, is thus made, twenty grains of sulphate of zinc in an ounce and a half of water, the draught to be repeated if vomiting does not take place in a quarter of an hour. After the stomach has been well cleaned out, milk, flour and water, linseed tea or barley water should be taken in large quantities. If eggs cannot be obtained, milk or flour and water should be given as a substitute for them at once. When the depression of strength is very great indeed, a little warm brandy and water must be given. In the course of an hour or two, the patient should take two tablespoonfuls of castor oil, and, if inflammation comes on, it is to be treated as directed in the article on acids and alkalis. The diet should also be the same. If the patient recovers, great soreness of the gums is almost certain to take place. The simplest, and at the same time one of the best modes of treatment, is to wash them well three or four times a day with brandy and water. 2658. Calomel. A heavy white powder without taste and insoluble in water. It has been occasionally known to destroy life. Symptoms. Much the same as in the case of corrosive sublimate. Treatment. The same as for corrosive sublimate. If the gums are sore, wash them as recommended in the case of corrosive sublimate with brandy and water three or four times a day and keep the patient on fluids such as arrowroot, gruel, broth or beef tea, according to the other symptoms. Eating hard substances would make the gums more sore and tender. 2659. Copper. The preparations of this metal, which are most likely to be the ones producing poisonous symptoms, are bluestone and verdigris. People are often taken ill after eating food that has been cooked in copper saucepans. When anything has been cooked in one of these vessels, it should never be allowed to cool in it. Symptoms, headache, pain in the stomach, and purging, vomiting of green or blue matters, convulsions and spasms. Treatment, give whites of eggs, sugar and water, castor oil and drinks, such as arrowroot and gruel. 2660. Emetic tartar. Seen in the form of a white powder or crystals with a slightly metallic taste. It has not often been known to destroy life. Symptoms? A strong metallic taste in the act of swallowing, followed by a burning pain in the region of the stomach, vomiting and great purging. The pulse is small and rapid, the skin cold and clammy, the breathing difficult and painful, and the limbs often much cramped. There is also great prostration of strength. 
Treatment Promote the vomiting by giving plenty of warm water or warm arrowroot and water. Strong tea in large quantities should be drunk, or if it can be obtained, a decoction of oak bark. The after-treatment is the same as that for acids and alkalis, the principal object in all these cases being to keep down the inflammation of the parts touched by the poison by means of leeches, warm poppy fomentations, fever mixtures, and very low diet. 2661. Lead and its preparations, sugar of lead, gular's extract, white lead. Lead is by no means an active poison, although it is popularly considered to be so. It mostly affects people by being taken into the system slowly, as in the case of painters and glaciers. A newly painted house, too, often affects those living in it. Symptoms produced when taken in a large dose. There is at first a burning, pricking sensation in the throat, to which thirst, giddiness, and vomiting follow. The belly is tight, swollen, and painful, the pain being relieved by pressure. The bowels are mostly bound. There is great depression of strength and a cold skin. Treatment Give an emetic draught, number one, see above, at once, and shortly afterwards a solution of Epsom salts in large quantities. A little brandy and water must be taken, if the depression of strength is very great indeed. Milk, whites of eggs, and arrowroot are also useful. After two or three hours, cleanse the stomach and intestines well out with two tablespoons of castor oil, and treat the symptoms which follow according to the rules laid down in other parts of these articles. Symptoms when it is taken into the body slowly. Headache, pain about the navel, loss of appetite and flesh, offensive breath, a blueness of the edges of the gums, the belly is tight, hard and knotty, and the pulse slow and languid. There is also sometimes a difficulty in swallowing. Treatment Give five grains of calomel and half a grain of opium directly, in the form of a pill, and half an ounce of Epsom salts in two hours, and repeat this treatment until the bowels are well opened. Put the patient into a warm bath, and throw up a cluster of warmish water when he is in it. Fomentations of warm oil of turpentine, if they can be obtained, should be put over the whole of the belly. The great object is to open the bowels as freely and as quickly as possible. When this has been done, a grain of pure opium may be given. Arrowroot or gruel should be taken in good large quantities. The after-treatment must depend altogether upon the symptoms of each particular case. 2662. Opium and its preparations, laudanum, etc. Solid opium is mostly seen in the form of rich brown, flattish cakes, with little pieces of leaves sticking on them here and there, and a bitter and slightly warm taste. The most common form in which it is taken as a poison is that of laudanum. Symptoms. These consist at first in giddiness and stupor, followed by insensibility. The patient, however, being roused to consciousness by a great noise, so as to be able to answer a question, but becoming insensible again almost immediately. The pulse is now quick and small, the breathing hurried, and the skin warm and covered with perspiration. After a little time, these symptoms change. The person becomes perfectly insensible, the breathing slow and snoring, as an apoplexy, the skin cold, and the pulse slow and full. The pupil of the eye is mostly smaller than natural. On applying his nose to the patient's mouth, a person may smell the poison very distinctly. Treatment. Give an emetic draught, number one, see above, directly, with large quantities of warm mustard and water, warm salt and water, or simple warm water. Tickle the top of the throat with a feather, or put two fingers down it, to bring on vomiting, which rarely takes place of itself. Dash cold water on the head, chest and spine, and flap these parts well with the ends of wet towels. Give strong coffee or tea. Walk the patient up and down in the open air for two or three hours, the great thing being to keep him from sleeping. Electricity is of much service. When the patient is recovering, mustard poultices should be applied to the soles of the feet and the insides of the thighs and legs. The head should be kept cool and raised. 2663. The following preparations, which are constantly given to children by their nurses and mothers, for the purpose of making them sleep, often prove fatal. Syrup of poppies and Godfrey's cordial. 
the author would most earnestly urge all people caring for their children's lives never to allow any of these preparations to be given unless ordered by a surgeon two thousand six hundred sixty four the treatment in the case of poisoning by henbane hemlock nightshade and foxglove is much the same as that for opium vomiting should be brought on in all of them two thousand six hundred sixty five poisonous food it sometimes happens that things which are in daily use and mostly perfectly harmless give rise under certain unknown circumstances and in certain individuals to the symptoms of poisoning the most common articles of food of this description are mussels salmon and certain kinds of cheese and bacon the general symptoms are thirst weight about the stomach difficulty of breathing vomiting purging spasms prostration of strength and in the case of the muscles more particularly an eruption on the body like that of nettle rash treatment empty the stomach well with number one draught and warm water and give two tablespoonfuls of castor oil immediately after let the patient take plenty of arrowroot gruel and the like drinks and if there is much depression of strength give a little warm brandy and water should symptoms of fever or inflammation follow they must be treated as directed in the articles on other kinds of poisoning two thousand six hundred sixty six mushrooms and similar kinds of vegetables often produce poisonous effects the symptoms are various sometimes giddiness and stupor and at others pain in and swelling off the belly with vomiting and purging being the leading ones when the symptoms come on quickly after taking the poison it is generally the head that is affected the treatment consists in bringing on vomiting in the usual manner as quickly and as freely as possible the other symptoms are to be treated on general principles if they are those of depression by brandy and water or cell volatile if those of inflammation by leeches fomentations fever mixtures etc etc End of section 104